On the 2nd of November, the elections of the Conservative Party will be announced, and we know that the final, the two final candidates, Robert Jenrick and Kimi Badenoch, are, uh, are on the right of the Conservative Party. So what do they know about their positions on Israel-Palestine? Yeah, I think being sort of left or right on the political spectrum doesn't necessarily determine your view on Palestine. However, mm. we do know about Robert Jenrick. He, he actually said at Conservative Party conference, if the Foreign Office doesn't agree to put the British Embassy in J Jerusalem, he will personally go and build it brick by brick. Now, this wow. man is an extremist. He does not believe in any kind of two-state solution, although he says he does. He knows nothing about it. He takes his script entirely uh, from the Conservative Friends of Israel and the Israelis. So he would be a disaster if he were leader of the Conservative Party. Bedenok, marginally, she might just win, but I haven't got a clue what her views are on foreign policy. Mm. I simply do not know. And it's one of the problems of all British politics now is that those in Parliament have got no real experience of the region. They haven't really learnt the history uh, and they just have very, very simple attitudes. And this is dangerous. Wow. W what is... What is it with the obsession of Robert Jenrick with Israel and the safety and the security of Israel? He made so many uh, statements. For example, he said he wants to follow in Trump's footsteps of moving the UK embassy to Jerusalem. He also called for a banning of pro-Palestine organizations and changing terrorism laws to lower a threat, uh, threshold. He also blames Islamists and the hard lefts for protests and many other statements he said that are obsessed with the security of Israel and ignoring all the rights of the Palestinians. It is disgusting extremism born of ignorance. Let's go back to <coughs> something that you said in the beginning of this conversation and something that you already wrote in your diaries. You said the conservative friends of Israel and, the Isra and Israelis think that they control the foreign office and, and probably they do. What do you mean by that? I think the influence of donor money really goes straight into number 10 Downing Street and then they tell the Foreign Office what to do. But I think Foreign Office officials who, you know, know what they're talking about, uh, don't necessarily share the view. They actually believe in their own policy. Mm. And the problem is not the government policy. The government policy is that, you know, all these settlements are illegal, uh, there should be a Palestinian state, blah, blah, blah. The problem is that senior people at the top of the Conservative government did not believe in their own policy. But they just pretended they did, but they didn't. And they didn't really believe in international law, as far as I can see, because they think international law, very, very important, except in the case of Israel, because they can do what they want. There is a bit of a conspiracy in a funny way between the, not funny particularly, but a definite way between the interests of the Israeli state, which means the embassy, and the Conservative Friends of Israel, who use money and donor power to, to, to work together to silence anyone who is pro-Palestine. So although they say they want a two-state solution, no, they don't. They and, don't. And Netanyahu now says he doesn't want it at all. So how can you deal with a country which actually openly says it wants to defy international law and keep doing what it's doing? Now, one thing that was a disgrace was Michael Gove, when he was minister, who is another completely sold out a sympathizer of Israeli extremism, he passed a law which said that local councils were not allowed to have a policy of boycotting Israeli produce, even if they're illegal. Mm. So you end up with one arm of the UK government saying Palestinian settlements are illegal, and another arm of British government protecting illegal activity in those Palestinian settlements. And Parliament was pathetic in opposing this piece of legislation. What value does the UK government place on the Palestinian lives? Not enough. Not nearly enough. I don't think people in Parliament are sitting there and thinking quite what the devastation of the Gaza Strip actually looks like and means to people in terms of human suffering. They don't even stop to think about it. Some are like Jenrick, uh, well, you know, Hamas are dreadful, we've got to eliminate them, you know, as if you can. I mean, they, he, he, he says nothing about the origins of this problem. So um, he is a disgrace. So I think what is also sad is the weakness of Palestinian leadership. 
Mm. And I think President Abbas has failed in articulating a proper case for Palestinian justice. When I first came into politics over 30 years ago, I made a speech in the Commons which said, Israel has a choice. It can either have settlements or it can have peace. It'll never succeed in having both. And at that time, there were 40,000 settlers in the West Bank. There are now probably 700,000. So that makes a two-state solution impossible, almost impossible, because They've taken all the good bits. They've taken the land. How can you have a state when you've got lots and lots of, uh, as I would say, illegal colonial towns all over the land? That means it is not going to be a viable state. So I think all of this talk, two-state solution, you know, people have got the right to defend themselves. And by the way, why can't Palestinians defend themselves against illegal settlers with guns supported by the IDF? If they do, they're called terrorists. Why? But they're not. That's the question, why? Because the language of all of this is dominated by the Israeli language and people don't stop and think about what is morally right. So a two-state solution is now almost impossible. And the debate of just talking about a two-state solution isn't enough. You've got to go back to the basic principle, which is Israel should get out of Palestine because it is not their country. As Israel attempts to erase the Palestinian people under the cover of darkness, targeting journalists and censoring the press, we must rise from the ashes. At Palestine Deep Dive, we are building a multimedia space where our voices, the Palestinian voices, are always front and center. And right now, we just need 3,000 more of you to join our regular supporters and back our work so we can rapidly expand our output. Help us build the future of journalism. Become a supporter at Palestine Deep Dive .com/support This is 100% independent media powered by you